Hello my lovelies, it is your girl Jessie here. I thought for Thanksgiving I would share some funny family memories with you. Back in 2010, my sweet aunt Glenda put together a book of memories where she had interviewed members of our families in the past. Our aunt Joanne, my uncle Leonard's wife, is the only one left alive now, so looking back this Thanksgiving I'm thankful for the time that I had with some of these lovely members of the family some of whom I never did meet I hope you will enjoy these memories as well the first one was written by my second cousin LeBron Calvin mate Joanne and Uncle Leonard's son one of them this is the story about my grandmother, who I called Miko, and her mother, Grandma Kate. Pretty funny. Give you a glimpse of how funny my grandmother was. This one's called Lessons on Gardening. One day, while visiting Aunt Evelyn and Uncle Albert, we were strolling around the outside of their house and admiring the view. Kate, and when he says Kate, that's my grandmother, Miko's mom. Kate had accompanied us on this visit and was along for the touring of the grounds that day. As we walked back up the back porch, Grandma made notice of Aunt Evelyn's wilting plants. Being the green thumb she was, she was quick to point out that the plants needed some attention. Obviously annoyed by Grandmother's judgment, Aunt Evelyn made her usual wadded up face and ignored the criticism. Grandmother, however, would not be outdone and said, Evelyn, you have got to talk to these plants. Aunt Evelyn quickly replied, I do talk to them. Immediately turning to one of the sad plants, she said, Well, shit, I see you die too. She then looked at Grandmother and said, See there, I do talk to them. Aunt Evelyn had many shining moments in life, but to me, this was one of the greats. This one was written by Lynn Calvin, another second cousin and son of my Uncle Leonard and Aunt Joanne. Uncle Leonard was one of my grandmother, grandmother's brothers, Miko, Evelyn. It's called Exploding Chickens. I had my appendix out in September of 1990 and was just home from the hospital when the power went out. I had been laying on the couch for only about 30 minutes after arriving home. We had no generator in the chicken house, and at that time it must have been 102 degrees outside that day. The chickens were six weeks old, ready to go to market. The National Guard even brought some generators, but couldn't get them to carry enough load to run the fans in the chicken houses. Those chickens just piled up and died, all 25,000 of them. A bunch of people came to the house to help. Bobby, Danny, Randy, and the preacher, just to name a few. The chicken guy from our supplier came up and said to dig a hole and bury the chickens, but warned, whatever you do, don't cover the chickens up because they'll blow up. Uncle Roy drove Tudor Moss's dump truck. Now, Uncle Roy was another brother of my grandmother's. No matter what you were doing, Uncle Roy always drove the truck. Anyway, they worked all day getting those chickens up. At the end of the day, when they were finished, Bobby said, Let's put a little dirt in on top of the chickens. The next morning, there were chickens in trees, on barbed wire fences. There were dead chickens everywhere. The lesson we learned was, don't ever fill the hole back up with dirt until the chickens settle down. Interview from May 5th, 2009 in Kings Cove, Alabama. This story is also by my second cousin, LeBron Calvin, called Toss, Roll, and Wrap. One Halloween, Lynn, Linda, and I, that's his brother and his sister, they lived right beside Uncle Leonard and his wife, Aunt Lucille, mind you. So keep that in mind as we tell the story. So he says they decided they would row Aunt Seal and Uncle Roy's yard. 
We waited until dark, got our gear together, and made our trek up the road. Think cat burglar as you envision this. At least that's what we thought. As we made our approach, we decide who will row and where to begin. All the while, we are thinking, boy, will they be surprised come tomorrow morning. We toss, we row, we wrap. We feel the pride swelling up inside of us when all of a sudden, boom, without our knowing, Uncle Roy has snuck out with his shotgun and shot straight up. We freeze. It is at this point that I realize that I have worn my brightest, whitest t-shirt. Being by myself on the upper end of the yard, I jump behind a utility pole. Now, we all know that I am famous for my dieting strategies, right? It is now that I discover that this week I had eaten a few too many Little Debbies, and in no way was this pole going to hide my portliness. I decide the best thing to do is run like crazy. I live in a streak of lightning. At least in my own mind, it was a streak. I'm flying down the road, and all of a sudden, I hear Uncle Roy let out a loud bolt of laughter. I, however, remember every cat burglar's motto, never admit your guilt. I keep my eyes on the lights of home and arrive there safely. Once inside, the phone begins to ring. I, of course, race to answer it. It's Saint Seal. Needless to say, my heavy panting from running gives me away and I am caught. I'll also have to add, Lynn and Linda fell prey to the give up or caught theory and hang around and enjoyed a hearty laugh with the victims of the crime. Actually now, I think of it, perhaps I was the real victim. Aunt Seal and Uncle Roy were gracious enough to offer toilet paper in the event of having anything scared out of me. This one was written by my Aunt Glenda, my dad's oldest sister. It's called Mother and the Snow. Ever since I can remember, Mother loved snow. Her favorite poems were While Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost and Snowbound by John Greenleaf Whittier. She also loved a good practical joke, sometimes at her own expense. Growing up, the drill was when it snowed, we put on at least two layers of clothes in order to go out, either to play in it or just to walk in the snowy woods. Afterwards, we came back into the house to get warm, dry off, and partake of Mother's homemade hot chocolate, consisting of cocoa, sugar, and milk topped with marshmallows and a pinch of cinnamon. On one particular trip home to Sand Mountain for a visit, Norris and I woke up in the morning after our arrival to a really big snow on the ground. Naturally, the day looked like it would be a fun one. Of course, we put off the inevitable. How will we get back to Memphis if this is still on the ground when it's time to go because we have to be back at work on Monday? Anyway, we indeed had fun that day. When we came back inside to warm up and get dry, Mother was sitting on her end of the sofa. Daddy was on his end of the sofa, and the rest of us were seated either in chairs or on the floor across the living room from them. Suddenly, Mother announced, Norris, look here. Norris is my aunt's husband. As these words were coming out of her mouth, she suddenly stood up. My, <laughs> don't try to read this. My mouth flew open. <laughs> I didn't have time to look around to see how anyone else was reacting because I heard an astonished mother coming from my mouth. <laughs> in unison, Daddy was aghast with Evelyn. Mother had snagged her thumb in the waist of both her sweatpants and her inner pants, long john underwear, and was standing there in her panties <laughs> with the outer pants around mid-thigh. At our reaction, she realized what she had done and quickly sat down while attempting to hide her panties with her, fold, her arms folded across her abdomen. All of us had a good laugh after Mother recovered, and I use the term literally. We have enjoyed this funny family story often throughout the years. We had fun that day, and as well as I can remember, we did make it off the mountain and back to work in Memphis. This story was written by my father, Alan Wade Haggard, who you all know and love. 
It's called the wrestling match. Uncle Leonard was always the one who played with us kids and we all loved him. But when I was 15 years old, he took me on. I was into wrestling and was skinny little runt. He wanted to see some moves and push the furniture back. He was much larger than I was, but I was fast and he learned to fight. I tossed him all over the floor and at one point slammed him into the wall and busted a large hole in the sheetrock in Aunt Joanne's living room. The whole time Uncle Leonard was laughing so hard he could not fight if he had to and all his kids were laughing at how skinny little runt like me was whipping their daddy. It was a fun fight and the only casualty was the wall. He fixed it without complaint but never challenged me to a rematch. It's just as well. I would have really felt bad if I'd accidentally hurt him. Now there's a story for you. Ask the Calvins about their version of that fight. It might be fun to hear what they have to say. Note, so far there has been no response to this challenge. This story is written by my father, Alan Wade Haggard, called Lassoing a Deer. Earl Calvin was the best shot Dad and I ever knew. He was a former Marine and a man that could shoot. Dad once told me that he once saw Earl aim at two birds on a power line. His preferred weapon was a semi-auto 22 cal rifle with open sights. He says it doesn't matter how near or far the 22 will do the job. He shot one bird, then killed the other before it had time to fly off the wire. Dad was impressed. I was only a kid when I saw his ability at shooting. He was using a 22 semi-auto and busting hickory nuts in Uncle Leonard's front yard. Every time he pulled the trigger, a hickory nut would pop, and I have never seen such fast shooting in my life. He was good, really good. When Granddaddy died, I found myself out in a boat with Earl Calvin. The fish weren't biting, but there, were, but there is never a bad day fishing. He told me a funny story that day. He was out fishing when he saw deer swimming across the river. He got the bright idea to rope it and then drown it. He got the rope around the deer's neck with no problem, but then it was pulling his boat. He figured it would be really tired by the time it hit shore and he would just jump off the boat, wrap the rope around a tree, then slit its throat with his knife. When the deer's feet hit solid ground, it took off like a rocket. Earl said he still had rope burns on his hand that had not healed. It was a sad time for me, but he gave me a much needed laugh. It was only a short time later Earl died from a heart attack at the quarry. I've always regretted not spending more time with him. Daddy also told me two more stories about Earl and deer hunting. One day Earl was hunting in thick brush when he heard something coming toward him. He got his rifle ready and when the buck broke through the brush, Earl took a quick but badly aimed hip shot. He said he must have hit the deer squarely between the legs in the worst possible spot. The deer jumped four feet in the air, did a 180 degree turn, and was gone. I had to laugh at that one. I have seen deer do strange things in the woods, but I've never shot one's balls off. The one time I ever heard about Earl killing a deer was when he was sitting in a stand and walked out. I'm sorry, I'm still thinking about <laughs> what I just read. Oh. The one time... <laughs> The only time I ever heard about Earl killing a deer was when he was sitting in a stand and one walked out into an open field in front of him. He took the shot, then regretted it. He said it was like shooting a cow in a field and he never went deer hunting again. That was Earl. He could shoot, he could shoot like nobody ever saw, but he did not abuse his gift. I always respected him for that. This is an interesting story written by my Uncle Leonard. Charles Leonard Cobbin um, called flooding common before TVA so what they mean is um, what the land was like before the TVA came in and, and flooded the Tennessee River for electricity I was 13 years old when Ma Dora Berry Hill died she died across the river after we moved over here they left me at Big Mama's house when she died. Big Mama was my Miko's grandmother. We were living at the Dial Place, Aunt Edie's, Aunt Edie's house, before we moved over to the Cooper Place. 
I remember living in the cove at the spout and beside Island Creek across the creek from where Virgil and Basie's place was in recent years. Daddy rented boats out to fishermen who came from Chattanooga and everywhere. A lot of people fished Island Creek in those days and Daddy had a bunch of boats. <clears throat> we lived there and there came a flood which happened a lot on the Tennessee River. The river came up into the fields not far from the house. You'd see everything floating down the river where we lived from above us. I went with Daddy and got our ladder. The current was so strong it scared me to death. I thought he was going to go over in the river, but he didn't. He fished out the wood ladder that we still have. It happened around 1939. Gertie was six years old and I was three or four. Daddy gave me an 1895 silver dollar his birth year. I later gave it to Lynn. He was living across the river on the mountain when he went into service in World War I. I think they lived on Sam Mountain before they moved off into Kettle Rock Holler. Note, this is the area across from the ferry landing where the trail goes up the ridge. This side of Island Creek Cove. There was an instance of a ghost sighting when one of the kids was going to the spring to get water. All the family once lived there. Charlie, Kate, Big Mama, and Big Papa. Albert Haggard and the family lived over in there as well. Albert and Lynn hunted back in there. They parked at the ferry and walked across the holler to go hunting. He may have told Lynn about the ghost. Ruby, Evelyn, Calvin, Haggard remembered. This was read by my Uncle Norris, my Aunt Glenda's husband, during my grandmother, her funeral, during my grandmother's funeral. We are here today to remember Evelyn, not how she died, but how she lived. From a high school girl who vowed in her senior high school year resolution, top more the next year. She evolved into a woman who never lacked for conversation. While her high school friends were enjoying their time off, she was writing to servicemen as her part in the war effort. She actually preferred a semi-private hospital room so that she could have someone to converse with. A woman with tireless energy, she painted the front porch on Atkins Drive every year whether it needed it or not. Hardworking to fault in the cotton field, she could outpick the young husband she married. Abra admits to stealing fluffy bowls of cotton from her row in an effort to outpick her. But when they got weighed in, her sack still outweighed his by two pounds. She was baptized in the Rocky Springs, Alabama Creek, as was Albert, and continued her spiritual walk by raising her children in the Baptist Church. She fully believed in Proverbs 22.6, which says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. As Albert was known as Papa, Mika was given her name when Jessica, their first grandchild, could not pronounce grandmother. Miko stuck. She loved her family and showed it in so many ways. Always the instigator of fun, she was in the middle of the hay rides, picnics, and starry night hikes. When having Papa's hunting and fishing buddies in, she entertained the wives with basket weaving classes, while the men were at the fishing hole probably telling white lies about the one that got away. She could cook a meal and have it on the table faster than anyone has ever seen. She loved the simple things in life. Collecting baskets and family pictures were her passion. She entertained everyone in her own home as well as taking food to the sick and clothing to the needy. She arranged baby showers, cousins' breakfast reunions, 4th of July get-togethers, and served food from the garden she and Albert prepared, living up to the instruction in Hebrews 13, 1-2. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. She was even bitten once by a dog while delivering a birthday cake she made for a relative which only deterred her for a short while. When a niece needed a prom dress or a wedding gown, she whipped those up on weekends while off from work. For Christmas one year, she surprised her grandchildren with matching dresses for the girls and vests for the boys and, of course, posed them for pictures. She was one who could take a good joke, even though sometimes unintended. Like the time she hinted to her family members that she would like to have a bottle of White Shoulders perfume for Christmas. She orchestrated a great response. 
There must have been five bottles after she had unwrapped her gifts, but she was laughing. She was also laughing when she instigated a rotten tomato fight, which escalated into an all-out war. She was blessed with many talents and didn't hesitate to use them. She dabbled in art, basket weaving, quilt making, designing clothes, canned, and was a historian. She made sure her grandchildren learned how to make live soap and boil corn in a black wash pot over an open flame. I wanted to insert here myself that uh, in her later days she also learned how to paint. I have one of her paintings. She could beat the socks off her children and grandchildren in a game of checkers. She tried to instill a love for and the value of history in her children. Many weekends were spent combing the coves and mountains. The hikes broken only by a stop for a cool drink of water from a mountain stream, while Abbott pronounced they were walking in God's country. She preserved history as well by helping to raise money to restore Harris Chapel at Hogsjaw Valley. This is the church I went to that I was telling y'all about that got destroyed by the tornado. She's buried and, uh, you know, all of her efforts gone to pot now, which is just really sad. When it was fashionable to be buried in a city cemetery or the National Military Cemetery, she chose to lie beside her baby brother in a country cemetery located on a small hill overlooking that old church she helped to preserve the memories of a time past. The same church where her husband had carried people to revivals with teams of mules and wagons. She has touched the lives of everyone who knew her in some special way during the short time she walked with us. Thank you for being here with us to share in the celebration of her life. Another thing to add that they did read at her funeral was the fact that her daddy owned the Bridgeport Ferry and he named the boat the Evelyn. I'm grateful for the time I got to spend with my Mika and Papa in their later years. My parents were divorced and um, my parents divorced when I was seven so I didn't get to see them just a whole lot. Seemed like uh, once a year or maybe twice a year. Once at the 4th of July thing she had. Once at uh, Christmas. Sometimes at over at Uncle Leonard's house for the weenie roast they had every October. But after Kevin and I got married and had kids, started having kids, we was up there all the time. We spent a lot of time up there. We spent weekends up there spending the night, hanging out, listening to them tell stories. And I'll never forget the day Papa loaded us up in the fancy little Buick car they had and drove us around. It would have been before we had the kids. He drove us around and showed us Harris Chapel Cemetery where we were saying that, you know, we're going to be buried right over here and showing us some of the old places they used to hang out at. Very different times back then and seems like very long ago, but it's not so long ago here in these Appalachian Mountains. I, my dad's huge into history too and Maybe some of my interest in the history um, came from my grandmother. She wouldn't have liked the ghost hunting aspect of it. <laughs> but telling the history and, and climbing the old hollers and, and looking around at places, I think would be, and telling the, the tales of those places would be something her and Papa would have both appreciated. Just remember, spend great deal time with your family enjoy Thanksgiving even the ones that pass share the memories of them as long as you share the memories and retell the tales they'll never lost or forgotten my last memory of Uncle Leonard was giving him a call one Christmas Eve I can't remember what year it was but I, I knew he was really bad in health wasn't doing good at all and something kept nagging at me. You've got to call him. You need to call him. It had come a really big snow. Gosh, I guess it, it had to have been 2010 then. Because I think that was the last time we had a big snow. I was seeing on Facebook, I believe, the grandkids, you know, my second cousins. His grandkids are my second cousins. 
scene will talk about surprising Uncle Leonard by going over to his house and spending the night with him on Christmas Eve. Then it came that big snow, so they all got snowed in together. So I called, and I think my cousin LeBron answered the phone, and I said uh, I could hear just the commotion of people talking and carrying on. I said, I called y'all at a bad time. I'm sorry. I didn't mean, you know, no, no. He said uh, he, he would love to talk to you. He really would. So he got him on the phone, and poor Uncle Leonard could barely talk. His voice was so weak. This makes me want to cry thinking about it, but the excitement in his voice was just so sweet. I said, I heard you got some company over there, and y'all got snowed in together. And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, we're all in here together for Christmas. And he died a very happy man. I can't remember exactly what month he died, but it wasn't long after this Christmas that he passed. But there's one thing that um, I'll never regret. And that was the fact that I listened to that voice that told me to give him a call that night. I got to hear the excitement in his voice and share that memory with him. And he was so excited. I called so excited. So just remember your family this Thanksgiving. And if you feel you need to call one of them, give them a call. I had this weird type of experience one time after that and that was with my mother I had decorated my house for Christmas and I remember I was really sick I wasn't going to have anybody over for Thanksgiving that year because Thanksgiving usually was held at my house it's held at Jennifer's now because she's got mother's house now and she has more room but mother was so sad I've never not gone somewhere for Thanksgiving and she guilt, she would guilt trip you into stuff my sister can attest she was great at that well I brought her over we listened to some of her old records I put bubble lights on the tree that was her favorite thing and something told me take pictures of her looking at those bubble lights so I carried her, made her get up, made her take the pictures, and we sat down for a little bit, and a voice told me in my head, snuggle up to her, you know, put your head on her shoulder like you did when you were a little girl. And I did. She didn't know what to think of that, but she hugged me and, and scratched my back like she would do, you know, just, I was instantly, you know, nine years old again. <laughs> But that's another time I was so glad I listened to that voice because I wasn't even going to have fix all that for Thanksgiving. You know, I mean, she, once she guilted me into it, and other was, well, gosh, you know, what if something happened? This would have been her last. And I remember fixing all that food, being so sick, I had pneumonia. I was so sick. But I'm so glad I did it. So, but like I said, you know, if you if you've got that voice telling you whether you believe it's uh, God, your ancestors looking out for you, guardian angels, somebody giving you that nudge that, hey, you need to do this or that because they know something, you know, like this is going to come up, then you better listen. I don't know. Maybe not all of us have that ability to feel that nudge, but if you do, listen to that voice as long as it's something that's good and not bad. But until next time, my lovelies, I love you so much.